welcome to Preservation and Protection, Managing Security and Historic Properties. Um, so excited to see this room full of people. I'm Megan Graphic Narby. I'm the Outreach Conservator at the Minnesota Historical Society. I am just the moderator for the session, so I'm going to talk a little bit to introduce the session and uh, like share some of my personal agenda with you guys. But mostly, uh, the session will be full of our wonderful panelists here on the side. Um, I'm a member of the Minnesota Alliance for Local History Museums Mutual Assistance Network and a board member, actually the chair of the Minnesota Alliance for Heritage Response. So I'm very interested in helping people uh, prepare and respond to like emergency situations, which is why I was really excited to help put together this session. Um, I uh, found, helped find these four experts to talk to you all about security because this is a really big emergency topic for historic properties. And so I hope that you'll get a lot out of this session. Um, before we begin, we had a question to get to know you guys a little bit better. We're interested in what type of properties you manage or what kind of properties you guys oversee. So uh, please raise your hand if you are responsible in some way for a historical society or a museum. All right. A park. A library. A courthouse. No courthouse. Bridge. Public Works building, an energy facility, an administration building, historic home, a historic storefront, something else. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out what this something else is. A pavilion. Sacred places. Monument. Armory building. A farm. Farm. Newport has the sacred red rock and the oldest log uh, facility in Minnesota. So two very important sites. Cool. All right. So we have like a lot of different things. Lots of different kinds of sites. All right, so we're going to talk about lots of different kinds of security today. These are like three kinds of security that are probably top of your mind right now and definitely were for me when we started this conversation. Um, Man-made security issues like people stealing things, people uh, like doing graffiti, uh, and definitely issues of arson, which uh, have caused some notable issues in Minneapolis over this past year. Um, but then as we uh, were discussing our panel last week, we discussed that actually animals can be quite a big problem for yeah. security in some buildings. And, uh, and for me, as the Minnesota, chair of the Minnesota Alliance for Heritage Response, actually uh, a huge security risk is natural disasters. And these are three images that I pulled from the news over the last year of uh, like cultural heritage places in the United States that have been uh, like very strongly damaged during different kinds of natural disasters, and this creates huge security problems for your buildings. So these are just some kinds of security problems that the session can hopefully help you prepare for. And I wanted to give you a couple of resources on emergencies that won't be covered in this session. Um, if you need to hire someone, and you're interested in hiring someone after hearing these sessions, after hearing these discussions, Google the Preservation Specialist Directory on the Minnesota Historical Society's website. This is a great place to find yourself a historical architect, a conservator, a security consultant, or any other number of historic preservation professionals. If you're in the middle of an emergency and you need advice, the National Heritage Responders are a great place to find help. They have a 24-hour email and phone number. They help anyone across across the U.S. And finally, this brand new organization that I'm the chair of, the Minnesota Alliance for Heritage Response. Um, this is a statewide network of museums, archives, libraries, and performing arts organizations. And, sorry. 
and historic preservation groups, which is why I was so excited to come to this conference to talk to you all. Um, we're really excited to serve all sorts of cultural heritage organizations across Minnesota, including people who manage historic properties. Um, so you can check out our website to learn more about this organization. We're very new, we just finally signed our bylaws. Um, and you can use this QR code to sign up for updates from us, because we're about to launch a forum where people can post resources and opportunities and questions related to emergency preparedness and response all about Minnesota we have a lot more at our sleeves as well. So, moving on from there, I'd like to introduce Miranda Van Vliet, who has been the primary consulting architectural historian to the DNR for more than 12 years. She has an educational background in architecture and historic preservation and more than 16 years of experience in cultural resource management. As the architectural historian to DNR's Parks and Trails Division, Miranda assists in the management of the more than 800 National Register listed resources on DNR administered property. And she's going to be telling us all about that. Oh, here. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. You can come over there. She's been to Over here? Well, none of, none, none of this feels comfortable to me. So. <laughs> I'll just sit here. Thank you, Megan, for that intro. Um, so this is just kind of a brief summary of the scope that the DNR is dealing with when it comes to historic properties. As you can see, um, we manage 5.6 million acres of land, which is about 11% of the state's total. In, that, in those lands, there are more than 40 National Register listed districts. Um, there are four National Historic Landmarks. And somewhere between 700 and 800 contributing resources within those districts. So we have a pretty broad scope of the resources that we're dealing with, which as you can see, range from buildings, bridges, dams, water towers, um, Something as simple as curves and parking lots, mines, railroad corridors, like all kinds of things, um, as well as numerous archaeological sites and um, landscape features as well. And this is just a snapshot of the parks and trails lands. And there, there are additional historic properties in forestry, forestry, fish, and wildlife lands as well. But primarily, we deal with parks and trails. Um, next, please. So, as Megan mentioned, we have security issues when it comes to natural disasters and wildlife. I would say wildlife is probably the DNR's number one security issue. <laughs> um, but in addition to that, we also have human causes of damage. And these are just a few examples of those things that we see frequently. Um, I would say the top two are graffiti and carving into historic materials, primarily log materials. Um, we have had a couple of cases of arson. This was um, a historic trail bridge that was set on fire. It is a National Register listed bridge. Unfortunately, it has not been fixed yet. There's not the funding out there to fix it, and unfortunately the trail has since been rerouted around it, so I'm not sure what the, what the future holds for that property. But in addition to those things, there are also damages caused by unlicensed research and or methods, and that can be metal detecting and potential disruption of known and, ar and unknown archaeological sites, as well as um, unlicensed drone flying in parks, which you know can be disruptive to natural resources as well as visitors, potentially. Okay. Next. And these are some of the implications that we see from these damages. As you can see, short-term implications can be degradation of the historic materials, you know, how, lo how long is a log going to last before there's just nothing left of it. Um, and with that repeated damage. Um, sorry. 
uh, the cultural resource staff review time, and that's not just our review time for these damaged properties, but that applies to SHPO too. Everything that we review goes to SHPO for their review. Um, and then time and money, obviously, and public safety. And the long-term effects are potential loss of historical integrity, that integrity of materials and workmanship and design, especially. Um, the impact on use, as I said, that trail bridge is no longer used now, and in its current state, it is still a danger. Um, destruction or disturbance of sensitive archaeological sites, and potential delisting of historic properties, which thankfully we haven't had yet, but if that bridge doesn't get fixed, that might, that might happen. Um, next. And these are some of our biggest challenges for the DNR is obviously the extent of the property and its remote nature and accessibility. How do you secure something when it's literally thousands of acres big and you can't maybe put a Wi-Fi security camera in the middle of nowhere when there is no Wi-Fi. Um, and we also have the diversity of built resources. We don't have this one-size-fits-all um, answer to securing historic properties. Securing a fire tower is much different than securing a cave or a, a picnic shelter or you know just the diversity. Um, and then we have the natural resources and landforms. This is actually at this is a mine. Or sorry, mine. Okay. Uh, this is a cave entrance at Forestville and that is a bat cave, I'm sorry, a bat gate <clears throat> and it actually had to be adapted because a previous version visitors did bring a reciprocating saw and took the gate out so they could get into the cave and so obviously we have to take into account how to still allow those natural resources access but also limit public access to spaces like that. And then obviously vacant and unused buildings can be a problem too, especially when they're in remote locations within the state parks. Um, next. And these are some of the solutions, and by no means do we have <laughs> all the answers. These are just some of the things, but conservation officers, regular patrol, security cameras, wildlife cameras, off-putting vegetation in strategic locations, <laughs> um, fencing and gates, education and awareness, lighting. I joked about putting, deploying a team of porcupines in strategic locations. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are just some of the things that we've done, and I feel like the DNR's approach to security is kind of more reactionary than proactive. Thus is the nature of <laughs> the extent of the land that they manage. So, um, I think that's it. Yeah. So thank you. All right, next I'm going to introduce uh, the needle lemon. Sorry. <laughs> Principal architect at Miller Dunwoody, she specializes in historic architecture with an emphasis on rehabilitation. She has a passion for projects that incorporate existing historic buildings to build on the strength and beauty of the past with the practical need to change and revitalize for generations to come. The success of her projects is drawn from technical knowledge, communication, and imagination to guide clients from what is to what can be. She has worked to retain national register status for many projects while providing defensible solutions that retain int original integrity while new laptop work, while incorporating modern systems related to security and technology. So here's Danita. Thank you, everyone. So as Miranda was talking about how the DNR needs to face it, you may have all had some questions about, well, how do we face this for our own buildings? And just listing here, you know, 
what are you? What is your building and is it a target? Um, you all noted a number of really interesting sites and structures that you have. And so kind of beginning with that is to really assess your risk and your vulnerability. Right off the top, um, you may need to consider who are those individuals, those aggressors and those individuals who would desire to do harm to your facility or your building, and then really what makes it the most vulnerable. And right at the top, there are four things, of course, that make it the more vulnerable. If it's unoccupied or partially unoccupied, always at a risk. As Brandon was showing, many of those areas that the DNR have do tend to be unoccupied for much of the time. Sites that are unprotected, and unprotected might mean that um, they don't have fencing or they don't have other things that protect them. And it also might mean that they don't have surveillance or after hours lighting. Also, again, Miranda brought in so much information, how you really look at, is your site remote? Is it that cornfield? Is it <clears throat> something that you're trying to protect that is away from your town center, that is more out in a park, in a facility? And then sites that have intended or unintended messaging. Um, nowadays, we're more and more accustomed to sites that might have picketing or protesting that you may have not realized could occur before. Um, we may recognize that that might happen at the Capitol, but where else can it happen? And it does happen in more pop-up situations. Next. So really what you need to do is to consider for your organizations, for your communities, how do you implement a plan? What is that plan and what does that look like? Um, right from the start, you're going to need to determine your budget and your process. You know, we always hate to bring up that budget number right away, that idea of what does it mean, but often it doesn't help you to have a great plan in place unless you have some idea of how you're going to get funding and really what is that order of magnitude for your budget. Many of what we can talk about and Joe's going to talk about is it doesn't help us to put in place a plan that you can't maintain into the future, right? And so we need to look at and implement that. There's two things that you can look at right off the top and we highly recommend that you consider your consultant pool. Um, as Megan highlighted for you, there's ways and there's lists for you to find those consultants, but consider that consultant pool. But also consider your internal um, process and who those individuals will be that you will earmark and identify within your organization that will kind of be your champion or take the lead on this. Some people might volunteer to do that. Some people you might tell them that that's going to be there. That volunteer, right? right. Um, so identify that staff. Make sure you know who's going to support this effort. It's an important effort and you all need it because as Miranda was mentioning, we want to make sure that your organizations are in a position to be forward thinking and not always having to be reactive. Let's not wait for the disaster, but let's put things in place to prevent it. And then identify that consultant team. In an ideal scenario and understanding budgets, you will need a security consultant. You may need an architect. Ideally, you have an architect who helps you understand that big picture. And in many instances, what you're putting into place, you may need electrical or other technology consultants as well. Um, I apologize for the formatting there, but you also need to understand um, your historic property and how the Secretary of Interior Standards comes into play. I always practice the Secretary of Interior Standards is best practices. So don't be afraid of what that is putting forward for you, but really recognize that that's a best practice and utilize things like the preservation briefs that are put forth by the National Park Service to help you understand and identify best practices for your building. You'll wanna create a work plan. I know that always sounds scary. It can seriously be a bullet point on a piece of paper that says, hire a team, find out who you're gonna have internally, and then make sure that you're gonna understand how you're gonna to put together that request to who's gonna help you, okay? And then one of the other things is to really make sure of is your timeline. So there are certain things that you may wanna fast track, but we also need to make sure that we understand, in particular if you have funding by a source, that if you need a SHPO or if your building is on the National Register, who else needs to review that and what timeline to get that in place? It doesn't help you to have a consultant on board to, and I shouldn't even say consultant, your consultant can be right alongside of you. It doesn't help you to have a technology team on board who's ready to install something if now you need to wait an additional few months in order to get your review process in. So make sure you understand that. 
and then you'll want to issue that RFP and then begin to look at how you're going to move that consultant team and into your process. Next, please. The next thing you want to do with your consultant team, ideally, is to create a pre-assessment. It's that critical information. What is threatened and what are the possible threats, as I mentioned on that first slide. Who are your aggressors or those individuals that want to do harm? This is something that we need to think outside of the box because sometimes that aggressor might be a raccoon. But that <laughs> raccoon can be just as evil in this aggression, or she, um, as any others. And then what hours are your, is your building vulnerable? If it is a building in the inner city, is that something, or in your community, is that something where it's only vulnerable when you don't have staff there? Or is there vulnerability even when you have staff because that staff doesn't have eyes on what you need to have on? So make sure you're aware of what and when your building is vulnerable. It's also looking at what are those vulnerabilities? Where and how do you need to protect your building? Um, if you're installing something that's physical, if it is a fence, how does that impact how people are going to be able to view and experience your historic property? How does it impact the appearance? How does it impact the materials? And how does it impact the future itself? And then what infrastructure is possible? Don't go ahead and plan a camera project if you now don't know if you can't get the technology there. Sometimes that's Wi-Fi. Even if you can't get elect electrical to a site, if you need to upgrade the electrical. Know that in advance so that you can plan for what elements you want to implement. And then that else, of course, is always comes back to how you're going to be able to plan your budgeting as well. Next step. And then, what are those measures, right? So you really want to deter, detect, prevent, and respond. So what are those measures? Are they going to be physical measures? Are you going to add fences, gates, glass protection is something that some of us, you know, it's not always about do you need to put up a piece of plywood. There are films that can be put on windows. There's other things that can be done. There may be after hours versus during hours type scenarios. There might be hardware on your doors that let you know that all the doors are locked um, at night just to give you that peace of mind, but also to make sure everything is secured. It might come into lighting. Is there just a motion detector? that goes off and allows that place to be lit when something is under, kind of, someone's coming near your building. And then what are those technology things? Are there cameras? Are there alarms? But again, understanding that technology appropriately. And then operationally, we can't emphasize this enough. We can put in so many physical measures, but unless you have an operational protocol to understand those measures, those measures might just be money that was spent and then not actually executed in an appropriate way. So make sure that you understand, is your building get locked down appropriately? Um, and then really, what are those after now hours? Is there a security person that's supposed to come by that maybe isn't because they're taking a longer break? These are all types of things that you should be aware of and understanding. Next slide, please. And then that design and documentation. Again, dependent on your scope and what is required, you may have a SHPO or MHS review. Make sure you understand that. Make sure you also understand within your community if what you're proposing may require a permit. Certain things on certain buildings may require a permit by your authority having jurisdiction. And then if that review is required, you may have more than just documents. You may have a narrative. You may need to do photos of your existing condition. And you may actually um, need to have drawings that are done by an architect or others. So make sure you understand your requirements for your building. And then if your building is, um, I think I'm trying to say in that one. Oh, it's the drawings, right? So I just added a second bullet point for the drawings. <laughs> Talk too much on the first bullet point. Um, so make sure that you have those drawings in place. Next slide, please. So a few things versus the Secretary of Interior Standards and Preservation Briefs. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, I don't want cameras on our building. That is true. Look at this beautiful um, historic brick building with that camera on it. Um, you know that camera's doing damage to that building. It was probably put on going right through the brick. Um, I'm sure all the cabling that got to that camera drilled through so much. So think outside the box. We don't always have to have cameras on the building to make sure that the building is protected. On this image, we are showing a very simple pole. These are kind of popping up more and more. You don't even see them in your communities. Actually, go out in your communities. Walk through Minnetonka. 
um, you'll, let me just talk about and Kato, sorry, um, walk through communities and you'll begin to see that these are popping up. They're very simple poles. Sometimes they're your light poles. Sometimes they're your other street signs. They have cameras on them. This is just one installation that actually is four cameras that are executed and can be um, put into a property on the side of your property. It doesn't even have to impact your historic building, but it has eyes on your building for you. And then how do you conceal that wiring? Well, sometimes just make sure that it's underground or make sure that you've thought it through. Make sure that there's a path so that it's not just plumped on in a random way. Next slide, please. And then the other one I wanted to talk about is lighting. That's another really great one where you want to think about you, in order to light your historic building, and of course many historic buildings were not ever lit, and so you will have issues um, with the Secretary of Interior standards for how you're lighting a building. If you want to light your building as one of your protocols, don't put it on your building. Put it again on a pole offset from the building that allows the site to be lit. And then often, in most circumstances, do it on a motion sensor. And that motion sensor does not have to be on the pole. The motion sensor, the small device, can be on your building. So motion around the building pops on lights on your site. It's another way to think about it without having to do any damage to the physical property to your building. And then also, be really sensitive to neighbors. In particular, if you're building, that popping on, make sure that you have the appropriate or someone to do the work on your building unless you get them to your site first. They shouldn't give you a document that says, I'm going to charge you this to do this work if they've never stepped foot on your site and they don't understand it. So do that pre-proposal walkthrough, and if possible, make sure that it's mandatory or highly requested. Um, make sure you review that proposal once it's received. And then also make sure that if the contractor needs those signed documents, make sure you get those from your consultant up front and make sure that permitting is happening. And then make sure that you have a pre-installation conference. So before anybody puts screws anything in, make sure they know and understand the work and that the individuals they're sending to do the work knows and understands the work as well. Then make sure also you have somebody out there doing observation of the work to make sure it's conforming to the way you want it done. You can hire your consultant team to do that. You can have individuals within your organization do that as well. And then a final punch list, but also make sure again that you bring in SHPO and MHS to review that, um, that final execution. And then make sure you do final quality assurance testing. In particular, if you're doing technology or hardware, make sure you test it before you let that contractor off the site. And then make sure you get your 10-month warranty review. In the state of Minnesota, we have a one-year required warranty. Do a 10-month review, make sure they come back and fix anything at the 10-month mark so that everything is done and taken care of by the time they say, oh, your warranty is over. And make sure you also, outside that one year, you might even have additional for other equipment. So some equipment might have five year plus. And then make sure you have an ongoing maintenance plan.
I have the best position in this presentation because Miranda and Danita have said everything I need to say and I could just say ditto and pass the mic down the line. But um, I thought it might be helpful for me to talk a little bit about what I think about as a reviewer because sometimes you send your project into us. Danita talked about send it to Shipper, which will reviews it. Um, and I thought it might just be nice for you to hear a little bit and then have an opportunity to ask me questions. I'm also going to plug my colleagues have a session tomorrow called Applying the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehab, a contextual approach. So Natasha and Ginny will be digging deep into what I'm going to just really quickly breeze over. So do attend their session. I think it'll be really helpful. Um, I, you know, I think you all know who the SHPO is, the State Historic Preservation Office, because you're here. So thank you for coming. Um, but you know, our office does a bunch of things. Um, I have the word duty up there, the State Historic Preservation Office duties, but they're not duties, they're honors for us to do a lot of this work, and we really enjoy it. Um, we're in this work because we love historic buildings. We want to preserve our cultural heritage and work with you all to do so. So uh, we work on planning certified local government programs like this. Survey and National Register, Tax Incentive Program, and Environmental Review, otherwise known as Compliance, which is most applicable to this conversation because a lot of the buildings it sounds like you're managing may likely come through our office for any review, or excuse me, for reviews of any changes you'll be making. Go to the next one. And when you come into our office for review, you're working with one of my beautiful colleagues here. Um, this is our environmental review team, Leslie, Sarah, and Kelly. They are fabulous, awesome, hardworking women who try to get your project through as quickly as possible. They work with um, subject matter experts like myself um, and my colleague Natasha. We both review architectural projects. Um, we have architectural historians, Jimmy Wei and Mike Koop. And um, archaeologist Lucy Harrington, one of our new hires, she's great, and David Matter, who's also wonderful. And if you picked up a copy of the plan, he's the photographer who did the cover photo, which I think is beautiful. But um, your project gets forwarded on to one of us, most likely, and we take a look at it to see how it um, aligns with the Secretary of Interior Standards. So, next slide. Um, you know, there's no magic, uh, magic, uh, formula to getting through the process quickly. What it really is, is knowing your project well. So um, for security projects, exploring your security needs holistically, thinking about what do I really need? Because that's gonna probably be one of my questions. I think Danita and I were talking about like, what are some of the low, easy, low hanging fruit, easy things you can do to achieve your security things? Did that work? No, okay, so maybe you step it up. So we're gonna constantly ask you like, what, did you try something less less complex than wiring the whole building on the exterior, mounting cameras everywhere? Um, you know, we're going to ask you what is your process. So you're also going to want to allow enough time to consult with our office to go through those questions. Where I'm going to ask some things of you, and you are going to respond, and we're going to kind of have a back and forth conversation. Um, collect and organize your documentation, your reports, your drawings, your scope of work. Um, your justification for why you really, really need to do X, Y, or Z to your building. I like to say, share your due diligence. Take me on the ride. You've usually spent, by the time I see a project, by the time Danita submitted it to us, you have spent, you know, probably, you know, one to five years of your life thinking about this problem. And it comes on my desk, and I've got, you know, a day or two of reviewing it to get caught up. So take me on the ride. All the things you've thought about why you're needing this, what it is that you're gonna, you're hoping to achieve with it. So I can understand and help balance those things out in my review. Um, do reach out to our office early if you have questions about how much you need to submit or um, what should be submitted in your package. Uh, reach out to us and I always say use your own words to describe what you're planning on doing in that narrative scope of work. So that accompanies your drawings. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so we talked about the Secretary of Interior you had a photo of the same building. Um, I recently had the opportunity to tour this site. I'm going to just do an aside. Um, it is a, a feed mill in North Minneapolis. Um, it is just a beacon for urban explorers because <laughs> why would you not want to climb all over this thing, right? And um, I met with the new owners of the building. And I'm going to just take a second to point out a sign, a sign, a light, a camera, 
fencing all around the site, but you know, obviously people are still be getting into it. And I asked, how hard is it to keep people out of here? And they said, well, you know, it was hard when we first acquired the building. And you know, we added the lights and we added the cameras and they said, but you know what really worked? Is we brought on a security night watchman. And that's <laughs> no longer do we have people going through here. So it was one of those like, they tried a few things. They took the steps and they landed on what we all might think is a fairly expensive route. But, but they took the steps. They tried first with like, will lighting do it? Will cameras do it? No. So eventually they ended up with a night watchman. So and Quentin's back there nodding. Um, I thought that was so helpful to hear. And it is going to be, hopefully, in the future, right, um, a wonderful place we can all go to without having to climb a, a fence and break in illegally. So um, keep your eyes open for, for work there. But anyway, I digress. Um, the Secretary of Interior Standards, there are four. We hear preservation, rehab, restoration, and reconstruction. They're kind of in the order of intervention. Preservation, we're, we're mostly trying to keep things as, as is, retain it as it is. Rehabilitation, which is what is most ap applicable to this conversation, what we do most often, which is to allow for new uses in the building, to allow for alterations that allow us to keep occupying that building. Then restoration, this is what you do to the beautiful house museum, where you want to bring things back to a particular point in time. Um, and then reconstruction, this is rarely done anymore. Um, a good example I like to use is at Mount Vernon, they found the plans for one of Washington's test barns, a round barn where he was testing out some agricultural ideas. They decided to reconstruct that building because it might lend some information for them about architectural practices and what George Washington was toying with. So reconstruction is rarely done anymore. Um, and Danita mentioned that there are preservation breaks. There is something called the guidelines. There are technical notes. There are all these wonderful resources that the National Park Service has published to help us figure out how to achieve the standards, how to make it work, um, how to do rehabilitation projects, to add things to a building without losing the character of the building. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So rehabilitation is the act or process of making possible a compatible use for a property through repair, alterations, and additions. So that's what we're talking about with security. We're doing some alterations. Um, sometimes we're doing some additions, which I think this is an example of an addition, a rather large addition. Um, this is down in Kansas at their capital. They needed a controlled environment to bring people into, so they ended up doing an addition on the back of the building at, at ground level, actually below ground. And this allows them to have all the space they need to check your bag and we'll have you walk through an x-ray machine while still retaining their primary entrance in the front. Mm. So a big effort to deal with security, but it was necessary for their particular courthouse. Um, so what we're aiming at when we're using the rehab standards is to preserve the portions or features of the building which convey its historical, cultural, or architectural values. Um, and again, Natasha and Ginny are going to dig into that a little bit more tomorrow, so do attend their sessions. Next up. So I'm going to flip through a few and just call out a couple of um, the parts of the rehab standards that I think most align with what you're going to be facing with your security. So, you know, we're looking for reuses that require minimal change. Number two is character is retained and preserved the removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property should be avoided. Now that is where it sometimes gets really hard. I didn't see anyone raise their hand for courthouses or public buildings, but you know, here's a good example. Our public buildings, um, and many of our historic buildings, have really large entry, giant volumes, because that was part of bringing people to the civic center to have discourse. And now, all of a sudden, we have to deal with funneling people through x-ray machines or one point of entry. So how do we do that and still retain a feeling of volume in a space? So this is one way that this project actually decided to do it, which you probably can't even see it in the slides, but there is a, I'm going to call it a fairly short glass wall, because they weren't worried about people, I guess, throwing bombs over it. They just needed to deal with everybody coming through one 
entrance so they could deal with security issues at that entrance. So they added a low glass wall. You can barely see it. So it definitely has retained that sense of volume. So those are the kind of things you think about. You look at your building and say, you know, the sense of volume is important here, the mass of this building, the materials, whatever it is. And that's what you're going to work really hard to retain as you're talking with Danita about what your project could be and what your needs are for security. So number three deals with changes that create a false sense of history. Number four deals with changes that have an acquired historic significance of their own. Number five, distinctive features shall be preserved. Yes, that's something we want to do as we're thinking about our security projects. You don't want to slap that security camera right on a highly ornamental piece of terracotta. Not a great idea. We're going to find a pole that we can place it on. Or really, you know, find a discreet place in a mortar joint where we can mount that camera. So we're going to be thoughtful about what impact our ideas have on the different features of the building. You can go to the next slide. Six talks about deteriorated historic features should be retained rather than replaced. Seven is about cleaning buildings in the gentlest means possible. Eight is protecting archaeological resources. I thought that doesn't apply, but that does apply. So um, as you're thinking about your security efforts and what that might be, even mounting a pole, being thoughtful about where that is, knowing if you have archaeological resources that need to be protected before you start moving the ground around is really important. Uh, number eight talks about exterior alterations or new construction. Like my example, if you're taking that path, if you're really having to jump all in to the most expensive option possible, um, is you know, being thoughtful about what that addition is and having it be compatible to your building. Um, new additions and construction will not damage historic buildings. And those were some of the places where I saw potential, I don't want to call it conflict, but potential opportunity for us to figure out good ways to achieve our security needs while still meeting the standards. So that was a super quick overview to help you understand what I reference, what I think about, and some of the places that I see potential um, extra work as you're thinking about your security projects. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so a couple parting ideas before I pass the mic, because I'm hoping we have time to do a little Q&A and maybe have a conversation about what we're all facing, is don't forget, and when you're thinking about your security needs, about natural threats, floods, wildfires, um, ice storms here in the state of Minnesota. I mean, I was recently thinking about, a few years ago, we had frozen ice conditions and a torrential rain happen. And we're gonna get more and more of that. And that caused a lot of damage to properties that had never experienced damage before because the ground was frozen and water was coming in all over the place. So I do wanna say, think about in tandem, holistically, security needs and sometimes these natural disasters, we can address some things that help us stay informed about our buildings together. So, you know, moisture, um, alarms, and things like that can be part of your security analysis. Um, this is a nice little example I like to show of a museum that has little security gates that pop up because they often have flooding. So sometimes simple ways to address problems. Um, instead of regrading, possibly disturbing archaeological resources around it, they were able to deal with this in a, in a really kind of nice um, site-specific way. Let's go to the next slide. And um, I want to say also part of your analysis in working with Danita is probably talking about when best laid plans go awry and when bad things do happen, to, to Megan's point. Um, Think about contingency plans and recovery plans when you're considering your biggest threats. So when the power goes down, what is your backup plan if you're relying on cameras? Um, when we can't get to a site because of extreme snow or extreme weather, what are the plans that you have? I think we've all seen after a natural disaster, communities essentially get gated off and people are not allowed in. Then what? What is your plan if your site is gated off and you can't access it. How is it going to remain um, secure throughout that? So really, I think my ending words are, I think holistically about your security needs. Consider simple fixes first and work your way up the ladder before you jump into adding that big addition to the back of your building. All right, thank you. Joe Hoover. 
Joe works in field services at the Department of Heritage Preservation Planning and Outreach at the Minnesota Historical Society as the Digital Technologies Outreach Specialist, providing IT and marketing consulting to Minnesota's local history community. He's going to come speak. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> All right. I have to get through uh, something. a whole bunch of slides in five minutes. So uh, I uh, figure it would be easier if I'm here just whack the button back. Um, so all right, so we're gonna talk so I'm gonna go into the minutia into the into the details of uh, Basically, components, security components. Really trying to educate you with what uh, what you're looking at when you're talking to vendors and when you're talking to contractors. Uh, so uh, the two things we're going to go through three topics. One is really what to expect from a vendor or contractor themselves. Uh, security alarm components, intrusion detection, and then uh, closed circuit television, otherwise video surveillance cameras. Right. Um, the first thing when you're dealing with vendors is make sure the products that you're working with, the components, are underwriter laboratory tested, all right? That they these meet national recognized standards. And you know you want to know the company that you hire is going to do the job correctly. If they're using sort of knockoff components, uh, that should be a red flag, OK? Um, additionally, Minnesota does require uh, two different kinds of licenses. And these are only for alarm systems. This is not for. Uh, 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 security cameras, uh, but uh, they have to have uh, a technology systems controller license and a power limited technician's license. Okay, so those are things that you should look for when you are hiring for an alarm system. Um, the other thing to look for is in, in your bids is so you got four different examples. You should be looking at the first at A and B and not C and D. Okay, you want detail in what you get. Um, it should be telling you what kind of cameras you're, you're getting, what kind of recorders you're getting, what are the features of those cameras, all right? If they're just saying eight, eight cameras, all right, you don't know what it is, all right? Uh, you need to have detail, and, and, and a, a good contractor or vendor will actually give you spec sheets on the products, too. They'll hand those to you, right? Another thing, and this is also important if you're a national register, uh, uh, property is you should be getting some type of floor plan, all right? Now, um, it, a lot of them don't even give floor plans, or you might get something like that, which is the uh, drawing over on the right. Um, but, but, but what's interesting about it is at least it shows the camera angles, and it actually says where the, what the cameras are. I've seen a lot where it just says camera, and you don't know if it's an infrared camera or if it's a fish eye lens camera. It's just a camera. So you should have something where you have the layout where the cameras are. Uh, it should have um, an idea of what the cameras are there. It should give you an idea of where the wiring is going. Talking what Danita was saying is that because, especially if you're a National Register property, but also if you have a historic building, all right, it's not on the National Register, but you, have, you want integrity. You just don't want the, if you are using wire, a wired system, not a wireless system, you, you want it so that you know where the wiring is, and maybe you can make it so that it's not as uh, uh, obvious, okay? Um, but one of the things that with cameras, you should be getting, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, that you should have the idea of what camera, and where it's pointing, but the, I also, you should have the idea of what the coverage is of the camera. What's the depth of field of the camera, and what is the focal length, length of the camera, okay? Now, oh, one of the things I forgot to tell you, actually, at the very beginning of this, is that that little URL at the corner there, uh, write that down if you want, because I'm going to have, I have about 30 slides here. I'm only going to get through a few of them, all right? Um, and there's a lot of information, though, that's good. And I know I'm talking fast. And I know this is very technical. But you, that will allow you to access this presentation. And you can download it, print it out, and use it for your reference, all right? So I forgot. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that. Um, so the next thing we're going to go through security alarm components, and uh, uh, and so and it says what, what they consist of these security alarm components. We're going to kind of blow through the ones that are grayed out. Uh, we're going to focus on motion detectors and remote 
uh, monitoring and mobile access. But as it kind of said, you know, like, you know, most of this is what you're, you've seen or you, you've dealt with a key, we, uh, key, a key alarm pad, alarm control panel, uh, door and key contacts, glass break detectors, uh, motion detectors. Um, so these are also available in wireless or wired forms. Okay, so if you're dealing with a place where you really cannot uh, have wired to it, you can use these. The problem with something like that is that, uh, especially if you're doing like battery operated, you have to replace the batteries. If you ever had a smoke detector and didn't replace the battery, a lot of people, their batteries, they don't replace them. Uh, so they have to be, you know, you have to have somebody do this, and especially in a volunteer uh, uh, operated building, that's really difficult. You have staff, you can assign the staff. Okay, so it does get very difficult for that. Um, but in, uh, but with, uh, uh, so with motion detectors, I just want to point out there are different kinds of motion detectors. There's three different made, there's three different made types. Uh, one is passive infrared, or oh, you see it as IR. Um, and those are what you'll see really widely in use. So the little, um, what's on the right there, little wall mounted motion sensor, small, low power, easy to use, very inexpensive. Um, the uh, next one is microwave. Uh, and these are sensors that typically are mounted on the ceiling. Um, they cover a much larger area, and the great thing is they go through walls. And they, but particularly, imagine if you're a museum or if you're if you're dealing with a store and you have displays. Um, you know, you want to be able to go through. Like if somebody's hiding behind a, a display, using that to block from a motion detector, that would be able to go through that. All right. Um, the problem with that is that they frequently give false alarms. But um, there's a third one, which is dual tech uh, hybrid, and that incorporates the kind of both the passive infrared and the uh, microwave sensors. And that has a result of much lower false false alarms. Okay. All right. Remote monitoring, mobile access. So that's really important as as far as. Uh, and that's the great thing about now with uh, with the intertubes coming in. Um, you have a you monitor that give you alerts. Uh, set up on your iPhone or your uh, laptop. The key thing, as I brought up before, is you need an internet connection before you bring in any security, any security devices. Um, but who will monitor this? This is also important. And it's, some of it's very costly. Uh, uh, some of it is you know is a little bit cheaper. Uh, so if you have the person who's the security dealer and installer, that alarm company that installed and sold the system um, may also have a monitoring station. Some of them offer that. And they will monitor it for you, private company. Um, but there's a, the central monitoring station where the alarm system can connect directly uh, to the emergency authorities like police or fire. Okay? Um, the important thing for that, though, is at the bottom, uh, basically a lot of uh, police organizations will not go out when they get a, uh, a you know, if there's some type of alarm because there's so many false alarms. Uh, they prioritize that there's some that they have some type of verified eyewitness response. So that's where maybe security cameras or even audio come in so that they can hear or see that there's somebody on the presence set. This isn't a cute raccoon <laughs> running scamp, scamp running through. Um, well, of course, they can do a lot of damage, as we've heard. Um, but we want to make sure that they're that they're going to not waste their time. They also sometimes have, they charge you. They might have like they come out once or twice, but after that they charge you like oh, I don't know, is it 150 or 200 dollars now? So um, now we move on to closed circuit television security cameras. All right. <laughs> I don't know, isn't that, uh, four, I think that's like 46 there, and then like 175 on that one. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so, uh, so the uh, security system isn't just cameras, all right? That's why I want to bring this up. Is uh, it, you know, so it can be one or more cameras, analog or digital. We'll get into that, uh, but it's also a recorder, all right? So I see a lot of you are old enough to know VC, 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 VHS recorders. You have to have something to put it on. Um, 
And so there's two kinds. One is direct video recorder, uh, DVR, and that's for analog systems. And the other one you hear about is network video recorder, uh, NVR, and that's for digital systems, right? Um, then to connect that uh, recorder to the camera, you're going to need a cable if you're not using wireless, all right? So for a digital system, you can do wireless, all right? And it's going to be a Cat5 or Cat6 cable. Um, and the great thing about that is that power actually is in the cable, so you don't need a separate power system to go to the camera. Now for a analog system, all right, you're going to need a co coaxial cable. Kind of like when you think of uh, um, your cable company, all right? It, you know, if you get cable TV, that's the kind of cable. Um, that doesn't carry power, so you actually have another have to have another power source to go to the camera. And, um, and then you also, of course, need a monitor. Uh, you know, 46 or 176. <laughs> um, I'm going to blow up my right this. <laughs> um, but this is here for your review. Is it just kind of talks a little bit about what the difference is between these cameras and how they process. Uh, your mind will melt if you spend too long trying to figure it out, but it's there for you to kind of look at. In pretty graphic. Um, this is more important. What are the pros and cons? All right. Uh, the, uh, the direct, uh, the, the, the DVR pros, which is analog, is price and compatibility. All right. Uh, that the excellent, so the excellent compatibility because these will plug and play between products. Well, Windows basically can use all these. You can use Dell. You can use all these different plug things, and um, it's cheaper. All right. Um, so they're usually less expensive and easier to install. Um, uh, but, uh, as I say, uh, with National Register of Historic Properties, uh, because you have to use cable, and you have to use power and a coaxial cable, two sources, you're going to have wiring running around. So that may be a problem in, in a uh, National Register building. All right? That may shoot up the cost quite a bit. Um, the cost, the, the DVR cons is the image of wall, Image quality is lower, but it's improving. Um, and higher maintenance costs because you have all those cables. All right? So it tends to actually be a little higher to maintain over time. Uh, DVR Pro, the biggest, uh, the pros for, DVR, for NVR, excuse me, are convenience and picture quality. So you have a, uh, uh, that you can connect these with Wi-Fi uh, and connect them wirelessly and not have the cables. But again, you have, you have the option of not having a power source to put a battery in there, but you have to change that battery, otherwise it's worthless. Um, flexible placement, it can be placed because of that, really in places you would not even be able to really get probably cable in some places. Um, you also, with an NVR, this can be cloud-based, so your recorder doesn't even have to be on site, right? You have to have very good uh, internet access, so you have to have the bandwidth to be able to uh, send the images up and to store that. Um, easy to use and configure, all right? Um, and so, uh, and the cons are cost, all right? A lot of this is still patent protected, so the costs are very high, but also the problem is compatibility is that when you use a system, you're pretty much locked into that manufacturer to use all the components, all right? So, and because of that, you know, like Mac, if you ever, used, if you ever bought a Mac, they're very expensive because they control everything. All right. Oh. Okay, good. All right, okay. three main types of camera, vandal dome. Uh, you see that at the bottom there? And we want to also want to talk about the ability of actually, you can paint these to actually match. And they do come in different colors. White just is very glaring. Like we saw it against that brick. If that had been a black camera, it would have been much easier to see. Or it much easier to hide. But you see that's the state capitol. They painted it to match the, the wall. Um, vandal domes, they're called vandal domes because they're hard to break. You, yeah, you can't see what where the camera is facing, the small size. Um, the disadvantage, because they're small, you can't get a lot of components in there, so they don't have a lot of features, and the infrared is terrible, all right? And bullet style, all right, these are bigger cameras, not, it looks like a bullet. Um, 
But because they're bigger, you can pack in. You have good uh, night, you have good infrared, and you have night vision. And those are two different types of ways of seeing at night. And that's later in the slides, but I won't get to it. Uh, large lens or a lot of advanced features like uh, fisheye lenses. The disadvantages are you can rip these things off the wall if you can reach them. All right. It's easy to know which way the camera's facing. And also, it's uh, good for bird nesting. <laughs> um, the last style is a turret dome style. And they're actually larger, than, they're much larger than the uh, uh, bandit dome. Um, but uh, they swivel, but they're, but they're not motorized. You can move them around. Um, that's a, and and they're, the, because they're larger, the uh, lens and infrared are separated by uh, separated by a different ring, so that makes the it, it makes it uh, much more reliable for infrared and not prone to infrared bleed, right, which is what the problem with the dome with the uh, dome uh, bandle dome camera has very strong night vision. The disadvantages of a turret: it's easy to know which way the camera is facing, and again, because it's big, it's not completely tamper proof. Um, if you're looking at a uh, what's called a point up uh, pan tilt zoom camera like a motorized camera, that's what it is up there. Um, they're great, but they're also incredibly expensive, and you really don't need them if you're not having a security guard looking at a screen that you can move it around. So, but you'll see those are a lot, especially in government buildings. Um, and this will be my final slide. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to say proper installation is important, all right? So this is a camera, this is a museum. They had problems with kids breaking in and vandalizing, and so someone put a, uh, a wildlife camera in a tree, and they caught this. And this shows some of the problems of what you see, what happens with the camera. The angle is too high, so you got great shots of the hats. Um, it's also focusing more on the building, and not on the foreground, all right? So focus is a big problem. The other one is that there's a is is a shut, is shutter speed, right? So they're running, and so if you have a shutter speed, I think of like I think, I think it's like one thirtieth of a second, it's going to be blurry, all right? You want much higher shutter speeds for that. Um, so you can see the different things with this. This is the problem of, but you have to have somebody who knows not just the camera types, but how to install them. It was. That's kind of what I got through. Like I said, most of this is on a uh, is, is available online, and I'll just kind of go. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, there's a lot more. There's a lot more, <laughs> <laughs> but it's there for you. All right. All right. We have ten minutes for questions for our panelists, um, and uh, I'll repeat them in the microphone when you say. One on Joe. Where you were talking the tampering of the cameras in the, yeah. in, on television, you know, on the movies, they use the infrared. Does that really kill the camera? I don't watch TV. You, like a laser, <laughs> taking a laser and pointing it at oh. the lens, oh. does that oh. actually oh. kill the camera? Spray paint. Well, oh boy. Well, first of all, a, a laser, no. Um, at least as I, I mean. I don't know. I don't think that. Well, well I would say that's spray paint, movies. right? <laughs> spray paint would well. Spray paint would disable the vandal though, because it doesn't have the components in it to actually. That's one of the problems. If the lens gets dirty on a vandal dome, it gets really. It looks ghosty and cloudy. So spray paint, I would imagine. But on the other ones, it may not have an actual effect because of the uh, because the components actually can can work over that. So. Cool. All right. Other question? Um, t two things. Um, I, um, I'm from Duluth, and um, I'm the board president of the nonprofit that owns the historic Duluth Armory. Um, it's been an unoccupied building for over 20 years and is a, fortunately on the verge of being um, rehabilitated. And thanks to Catherine and crew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, you know, they say in in the rehab industry that that the most dangerous period for a historic building is when it's being um, rehab. Can you comment on that and any suggestions um, for us on that? Yeah, I have Danita weigh in on this too because um, when you start opening up a building, 
um, bringing tools on site. You start to make, I think, what, what is the term you used? It's, um, it's more appealing, it's attractive, it's all of those things. Attractive nuisance. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not even, I mean, it, yeah, attractive nuisance, but at this point it's just all right attractive for everybody, right? From your urban explorers to people who are trying to steal tools or copper or materials. And so um, I think being thoughtful about that, I know when I worked building management of a historic structure, we often included in our contracts that when contractors were doing something dangerous to the building, like welding in place, that they have a fire watch of a person who's assigned to sit there and watch during and for a period afterwards in case a hot spark flies. Um, thinking about how you can do those things. Site, um, site protections, fencing is a really important thing. Who has access, who has keys? Thinking about all those things. Danita's nodding, so I know she's got a couple things she wants to add. Oh, she's agreeing, I know, I like this, I could agree. Um, thinking through those things, and you know, uh, I think one of, the, one of the things that I've found in having conversations about vacant buildings is, um, and going even back to our keynote this afternoon is when the community feels like they have buy-in, which I, the Armory people have a lot of buy-in and want to see it succeed, right? You've got a lot of eyes on that building, watching it. Um, and you have a lot of people who feel strongly about seeing it, seeing it come to fruition. So it's even thinking about the component of talking about your project in the greater community and getting everybody out there, protecting it goes a long way. I'll also add that we are seeing a lot more vandalism during construction. So make sure that during construction, your contractors are given the responsibility assigned to them of protecting the site. They have that responsibility, but make sure it's very clear in the specifications that they understand that. Even to the point of having them be assigned to hire that night watch if they deem it is necessary or having someone watching a surveillance camera. Um, again, the surveillance cameras are only as good as if you have eyes on it and someone's getting triggered that there's an incident. So having a camera doesn't help. It's if you have some way that that camera is actually being watched so somebody can actually respond to it. So again, during construction, very important. So we actually have contractors, they have to do preservation plans, they have to do a lot of other kind of steps, it's part of their submittal process before a project can start, have them do a security plan as well and make it their responsibility. Thank you. And the, I wanted to mention, that this is a suggestion from the audience, so as I mentioned, this building has been unoccupied for 20 years and the windows have been boarded up for most of that time. And what we've done is we've painted um, black silhouettes on the boarded up buildings um, of the famous musicians and speakers, athletes and all who performed um, in that building over the years. And um, it has helped a lot with community acceptance of a big vacant boarded up building is having those silhouettes I, and I think, compliments. I think it's important uh, that uh, in, that's actually it sends a good message that the building is still loved and still building is not just vacant um, but it is one of those things where I would change those out every so often so that people still see that oh look there it, it, there it's there's interest that this isn't just peeling and going you know it's been there for two years but if it's changed out every few months you know seasonally like ooh, here's here's a snowman um, <laughs> but you see but that would be also in, even more helpful because then people see that it's it's actively watched. I'm just gonna say we're all super lucky that we are involved in preservation or have our professions in preservation because we get access to these buildings. We get that, that curiosity is answered. Um, Duluth Armor, you've done a nice job of being in in the news, in the public, so people know what it looks like inside. Nothing is more attractive than what's in that building. Like we, we all want to do that. That's why we're here. I, I mean, I often say we are one college course away from turning every urban explorer into a preservation architect. Like honestly, they are attracted to these buildings for a reason. 
And um, you know, we're just all lucky that we're, on, we're in the inside group and we get to see it. But I think giving people access to know what it looks like if they can't have physical access, talking about what's going to happen there and sharing some of it the answers, all that curiosity, because we all want to know. That's why we're here. Yeah. You mentioned physical access, and it just dawned on me the eagle nest that you know you can go online and watch the eagle raise the young. Why not do that on those buildings? Let people see the progress. But the camera's running, yeah. so the vandals might stay away. Yeah, yeah. Um, to me, I don't know if you knew Steve Weeks at the University of Minnesota College of yeah. Design. He put a camera up when they were adding on to the Wiseman Museum, which was really neat. You could watch the progress of the museum's addition in real time. It was really fun, so that is a fun idea. It is a fun idea. That. Also, check with your contractors if you are having a larger, so a more sizable project. A number of the larger contractors do also do that ongoing camera and do just have it on their websites because they use it as a promotion. So that's another way to do it. That, that was actually what I was trying to add on to you. We were talking about sometimes about having security on site. That's always usually the easiest uh, uh, deterrent, but also one of the more expensive. Um, we found uh, wireless cameras, uh, job site cameras, as, as a contractor and interested in pres preservation, putting that on there and making a big deal and making it public about what we're doing and making that on the live feed, that's the best 20 bucks a month we can spend. And I mean, you can't even get anybody to show up on site for that. And, and now it's public because now they're worried about it's public to the whole world to see, you know, not just, just you know, uh, maybe a security guard catch it. So that, that's been the best economical way to, to, yeah. to save Simple, things. low yep. cost ways that we can address some of these things um, just makes me happy because I know we're all wanting to put that money into other things in our buildings and other things into our development. And um, to be honest with you, vandalism sets us back. I mean, if a raccoon comes into your building, <laughs> and, <laughs> oh come on, they're born with a mask on. They're <laughs> I mean, I worked in Alaska for a little bit, and raccoons and porcupines were actually horrible about chewing the wood off of our buildings because of the lead paint. So they would come in and just annihilate um, everything they could reach because it tastes really good. So <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. And we have that, I know, but sh they haven't done damage here. So. Um, but yeah, I, I love this. So I mean, please share amongst yourself those things that have helped um, address some of these problems. But I know um, in, in my past, I, I had the opportunity to talk to the vacant buildings inspector from St. Paul. And it was amazing what people will do to access buildings and how they will hurt themselves in the process of doing so. But you know, I will say about cameras and alarms and things, I have a funny anecdote that I used to have a favorite store that I went to all the time and one morning I'm like, I have to go buy a card. I'm gonna pop into this store and buy a card and I walk in the store and like nobody was behind the counter and the lights were off and there was kind of this low hum happening in the background. I'm like, this is really strange. And finally I looked at the door and they had their hours of operations listed and I had entered before they opened. <laughs> they had a camera, they had an alarm system, which was the low humming noise, and I stood in the middle of the store waiting for the police to show up. <laughs> um, and nobody came. So I grabbed the card and called the owner at her home and said, I think I inadvertently broke into your store. The police are not here yet. You might want to call them to avoid the $200 fee and probably come down here. And she said, I don't have a car today. And I said, where, where do you live? And she let me come and pick her up and then I brought her back to the store. So in all of that time, the police still hadn't shown up. And I'm like, I have to go to work. I'm going to call and check on you later. And she said it took them about an hour, hour and a half before they showed up. Wow. So um, that was my accidental break in. But it tells you about the response time. I mean, she probably has camera footage of me standing there dumbfounded, <laughs> realizing I broke into her store. Um, but thinking through, had she locked the door? I never would have broken. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes just putting into place things like, Locks and fences are really simple ways to keep me out of your business. All right, thank you.